All right, and welcome back, everybody, to episode nine of the third season of the Building Lifelong Athletes podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Renke. Thanks so much for stopping by. I really appreciate it. Today, we're talking all about needle tenotomy, so a procedure we kind of referenced earlier in our prolotherapy and PRP injection lectures, but we're talking about needle tenotomy today, its use cases, the procedure itself, and the recovery for it. So today, we're going through a specific paper, so we're kind of going through one article that was kind of a review about this topic, and we're going through it kind of systematically, so kind of a little bit of a change of pace, but I kind of wanted to dive through this because I think it's a really nice article. So let's dive into it. We're going to talk about this article here. All of the article will be linked in our show notes if you want to take a look at it, but it will be there. First, kind of overview in terms of tendon issues, right? So tenotomy, the root word of that is tino, which is talking about tendon. So we're talking about tendon injuries today. And essentially, tendon injuries were 12% of PRP use. So this study that we're going to talk about today talks about, hey, what's the recovery process? What is the offloading we have to do after we do a needle tenotomy with PRP? So it's looking at that specifically. We'll talk about how we extrapolate that and whatnot, but we're looking at PRP and tenotomy and kind of how we take our post-procedure process, how that works. So PRP use was used for about 12% of, of the all PRP injections. So obviously the majority of it's probably arthritis, but still used tendon for a decent bit. And overall, as we've mentioned in our previous PRP lecture, the data is super heterogeneous in there. There's lots of stuff that's going on, lots of factors that could affect treatment in terms of, you know, the platelet concentration, the leukocyte concentration, the spin times, all these various things that we've talked about previously, but it's very heterogeneous. So it's hard to know definitively here. There are also differences in terms of like the onset of when we start to see improvements from BRP versus other injections, right? We tend to think this is more of a a slower onset and has a longer follow-up in terms of we see benefits later. And so compared to steroids, steroids are usually pretty quick in terms of we're just dropping a grenade on everything, calming things down, and then we feel good right away and then not as good long-term. And PRP is kind of the opposite where we stir things up, doesn't feel good. I'm going from there. But like I said, when looking at PRP, it's hard to know what causes what and how much of an effect the specific formulation of PRP had because everything is so heterogeneous. There's so many different ways to do it. The formulations are different. Like I said, that leukocyte rich versus poor and all that stuff. And that being said, there's so many post PRP protocols. So when we talk about all the different variables, this is just another variable we need to talk about in terms of some people say you should not use NSAIDs. Others are like, ah, it's fine. Some have a specific physical therapy regimen that you're starting right away. And so there's just a lot of heterogeneity. This is not looking at the specific PRP they use. That is a whole different study. This is looking at, hey, of the literature that's out there, what does it show in terms of getting that kind of post-injection protocol? Like, what are people doing? That's really what this review was looking at. So the goal was to systematically review these protocols utilizing the setting of PRP injections for tendinopathy. So looking at, hey, what do people do and go from there? Things they were looking for, they looked at things like weight-bearing restrictions, meaning, hey, are we actually having non-weight bearing? Are we taking people, putting them on crutches? Are we not letting them walk? Are we activity modifying them saying like, hey, you can't do this level of activity? Are we putting them in braces? Are we starting them with physical therapy? Are we putting them a use or restriction of a certain limb, meaning you shouldn't use it? So like I said, all those different things they talk about and NSAIDs as well. Should we use NSAIDs? Should we not? So lots of different variables and lots of different combinations that we see throughout the literature. And you'll see here, semi-spoiler, that there's a whole lot of it out there and there's no one big thing, but Let's talk all about it. So first and foremost here, let's talk about the methods, right? So the inclusion. So the inclusion criteria here, this had to be done on humans that were 18 and older and we're looking at PRP for tendon treatments, right? So obviously not for arthritis, that wouldn't be a good use case here, but for tendon treatments, looking specifically for that. These are either gonna be randomized control trials, case control or case series papers. And we're looking at some primary and secondary outcomes. Primary being where they're trying to categorize the protocol based on the use or restriction of NSAIDs, physical therapy, bracing, weight bearing modifications, and activity modifications. So once again, all those things we talked about, can they be on NSAIDs? Do, are they in physical therapy? Are we wearing braces? All those things, that was their primary outcome. Where the secondary outcome was looking at the timing of those different mentions. So like I said, primary is, hey, what did you do? And secondary, if we had that, was, hey, when did you do that? Overall, the results of this, there was a total of 84 studies included in this review. There were 43 that were RCTs, eight case control, and 33 case series. So decent bit of data there. And predominantly, like there's a decent split. There's 37 in the upper body, 42 in the lower body, and five looked at multiple tendons. So kind of throughout there. And like I said, what they looked for here, specifically with post-procedure rest, weight bearing, did they wear orthoses, were there activity modifications, all that thing. At the end of the day, for those, 80% of people didn't report any specific post-procedure rest, weight-bearing, or orthosis use. So in terms of recommendations, it was just like, yeah, we did this, and we don't really necessarily know. you know. But of that, you know, those studies, 20% did recommend a period of immobility of that affected limb. So when we mean 
period of immobility. What we're not saying is you don't do anything, just sit in the bed. What they're saying is, hey, if this is like an Achilles issue, we're probably going to immobilize that in a boot in some way, shape, or form. So it doesn't necessarily mean they're non weight bearing, like on crutches, but it might just be, hey, we're going to limit how much you can move. So we might put you in a boot or something like that. On top of that, of those studies of the 20% that did, you know, have a period of immobility, 71% of those specific studies limited mobility to less than, you know, 30 minutes right after specifically. So like they categorized even more in terms of immobility saying, Hey, should we immobilize them in a boot? But then also they talked about a post procedure immobilization, where it's just saying they're, they're sitting there after they get the injection, waiting for 30 minutes. The idea that theoretical, once again, everything in PRP is technically like theoretical, right? Is they want someone to sit still for about, you know, 15 to 30 minutes to let the PRP quote unquote bind to the tendon. That is a general thought. The thought behind why they wanted to do that, like I said, is that a super common procedure? I don't think so, but like I said, it is in literature and they want to mention that. So like I said, of the ones that all the 20% that talked about immobility of an infected area, meaning not moving, whether it's at home long-term or right after, like I said, 71% of them to talk about having that um, they had a mobility less than 30 minutes. So nobody's just sitting there for hours, hours, letting the PRP bind. So that is something to consider as well. And however, of the overall studies, 88% didn't report any weight bearing restrictions. So like we talked about weight bearing restrictions, can they walk on their leg? Can they use crutches? Do they need to do that? And anything like that. So only 12% mentioned any sort of form of weight bearing. Most of these are lower body and they typically range if they did do non weight bearing or some sort of weight bearing restriction is usually a short term, like two to seven days, which I think is pretty solid. I mean, convincing someone to non weight bear for more than seven plus days for a tendon issue seems a little extreme. Like I said, but Hey, we're still trying to figure this out. And in terms of orthoses, so, so like foot orthotics or inserts, did they use those? 82% of people did not report the use of that at all after PRP. And like I said, that was the vast majority did not. But of those that did, there were four um, in the upper body, use either a sling or ten tennis elbow strap for tennis elbow injections. And then for the 11 studies that were lower for Achilles, there were about 53% um, about of the studies that actually did do some sort of bracing or whatnot. 53% of them used a crutch or walking boot. And then 24% did the same for plantar fascia as well. So, you know, about half the studies for Achilles and a quarter of it for plantar fascia. Once again, not all the studies, the vast minority of the studies mentioned this, but for the small percentage of ones that did talk about orthoses, um, the majority of them did either boot for Achilles or crutch and then for plantar fasciopathy, also a boot as well. And so of the studies though, about 50% did mention some sort of activity modification. So that's kind of nice as well. You know, they might not have talked so much about immobilization or anything like that, but, but for, in terms of a activity modifications, it did seem like, oh, about half of them mentioned that for activity modification and activity limit limitation, I should say is 26% of them were limited for less than two days, about 57% for two to seven days, and then 17% for more than seven days. So, uh, about the majority of people were sitting in that two to seven day range. And once again, this is kind of activity limit limit limitation, not necessarily modification because they'll be modified for much longer, but a limitation wise, what we're talking about is, Hey, I really want you to take it easy for the next couple of days. Most likely in terms of, Hey, no heavy lifting, none of this stuff, you know, no, no, even like significant strengthening work, anything like that. So that's generally what we're thinking about is we're kind of given a period to kind of calm down. So eight of the 84 papers mentioned no activity restrictions whatsoever. And so of those eight, they're just like, all right, let's go for it. I assume they did not give those instructions to their patients, but they didn't mention it in the specific study. In terms of rehabilitation, obviously a lot of people talk about getting into rehab and doing, you know, physical therapy after PRP. I'm a big proponent of that. There are two main phases that we seem to be recommended after this. So, you know, first being range of motion and the second being strengthening. And in the studies, 51% mentioned range of motion and more 54% mentioned strengthening. And most people in their sequence did phase one before phase two, meaning that the majority of the times they started range of motion training. And then after that started strengthening, but there were a few that mentioned doing them together, meaning we started range of motion and strengthening together. Um, 43 total papers specifically mentioned a formal rehab activities and 30% of those initiated phase one within two to seven days of post-injection. So once again, phase one is that range of motion. So 37% of those started that within two to seven days post injection and phase two was commonly initiated between days 14 and 21. So about 56% of the protocols started phase two. So once again, breaking it down into real life terms. What this means is, Hey, you get your injection and they start phase two or phase one to stay within two to seven days. So like I said, they'll probably have activity limitation for, it looks like one to two days. And then once the activity limitations kind of go off, we start potentially working on these range of motions within two to seven days. And then after that, we start phase two, which is strength and exercises anywhere from like 14 to 21 days. And so this is the general thing. And then in terms of recommendations for removal of the restrictions and return to play 42% of the papers discussed return to play protocols and had it about four to six weeks. And so like I said, that's kind of out there. If you think about the framework there, it's two to seven days for phase one range of motion, then maybe 
two weeks ish we're starting for strengthening and then four to six weeks for return to play so not the most aggressive return to play protocol but once again it's a, a protocol and these are the averages and this is studies what we're looking for like obviously everyone's going to be very different and depends on the level of play for your athlete and the level at which your athlete's competing but that's the general idea another topic looked at was NSAID restriction meaning hey did they allow people to take NSAIDs? 80% of the papers didn't report any restriction on NSAIDs prior to the procedure. Of the 17 papers that actually did, 10 withheld NSAIDs seven to 13 days prior to the injection, whereas seven restricted for at least two weeks. I mean, that's some dedication to say, hey, for two weeks before this procedure, I don't want you to take NSAIDs. So that's a pretty big buy-in by the patient. Like I said, you have to get a lot of buy-in. And if they're in a lot of pain for some reason, it could be challenging potentially to do that. That being said, 56% of the protocols restricted NSAID use in the post-procedure. So like I said, pre-procedure, 80% didn't report that. So it was like, ah, didn't really have much of that. But post-procedure, 56% of about half of them did mention some sort of NSAID post-procedure. And about 13% of them restricted it for, you know, 13 days or less. And 38% um, restricted it for anywhere for greater than 13 days. So there were some papers that like restricted it for up to like six months, which I, I mean, how can you how can you possibly do that in terms of like does this person never get a headache or anything like that so that's a little a little extreme but that that was something we saw as well so that was like the raw data we're going to kind of work into the discussion now and then we'll talk my take at the end here so overall though we're going to talk about the most common features meaning present in greater than 50 percent of the studies there seemed to be a short period of weight bearing restrictions for lower limb weight bearing tendons so meaning like a patellar tendon or an achilles tendon those are kind of weight bearing tendons there seemed to be a short period of weight bearing restriction not necessarily non-weight bearing but to alter in some way whether that's a boot or crutches or anything like that typically stretching programs were initiated within one to two weeks following the injection and then strengthening programs initiated about two weeks after the injection so like we talked about that phase one phase two that's kind of what will make sense and that's kind of the general principle for most rehabilitation programs in terms of injury we want to make sure we have range of motion first and then after range of motion we move into strength and then strength and proprioception yada 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 but it kind of follows just general principles that hey let's get range of motion first as we work through that then we can consider working on strengthening so about range of motion at about one week and then strengthening about two weeks most of the studies also talked about NSAID restriction for about one to two weeks following the injection which i think is reasonable that's not unreasonable as well so like i said that's kind of what we're working on and the reason that like i said we just want to touch on NSAIDs as to why we consider that is because you know you might be like well what what the heck well if you go back to our NSAID lecture talk about what do NSAIDs do they are all about turning down the inflammation process right so when we have inflammation when something needs to heal what happens is we have inflammation first that's the first thing your body's just like oh what's going on let's bring everything it brings all the inflammatory markers there and kind of starts that process and then when we have that inflammation there then eventually we have proliferation so kind of growing of the substances we need whether that is you know growth factors tissues that we need to regenerate anything like that it leads to proliferation of those things and then we have remodeling which remodel is changing the actual structure so let's say we had like a hamstring strain for some you know you pulled your hamstring since you have inflammation there that's when we can get bruised up and swollen and everything's just coming there to kind of help it out and say hey something's going on there let's bring in what it needs and then it starts to proliferate the actual substances we need so if inflammation is just kind of like a signal like whoa, whoa, whoa what's going on and then these bring in these other factors that kind of help this proliferation of these factors the things that kind of get ready and then we remodel so essentially this is the process where we're having you know an actual change we're kind of helping and heal up that you know, either tendon or muscle, what it is kind of making physical changes there and, and, and changing how it, how it looks to kind of help strengthen again. So that's what we generally see. So inflammation triggers that, right? So inflammation triggers that response and that whole remodeling response. So we want inflammation for healing response. And that's why in this theoretical model, giving NSAIDs might inhibit that. Uh, who knows? That's, is that, is that definitively true? I'm not sure. We don't know at all, but like I said, that is something we kind of think about. And so Overall, though, like I said, NSAIDs depends on what you read, and some people will limit it, some people won't. Like I said, that's that's your mileage may vary. And so overall, though, like the general theme of rehab is typically rest and then you know range of motion, strengthening, and then return to play. Like I said, just like other return to play, we kind of make sure in the acute injury we're not in there doing anything active. We're kind of just letting things calm down for just a little bit, and then we get that range of motion back. We strengthen it up, and then once we strengthen it up, we think about return to play. And obviously, return to play is a whole different podcast series that I'll probably talk about in terms of rehab and getting back to ready from an injury. But obviously, that involves more than just strengthening. You have to be use your specific sport measures or your specific activities that you want to do, and kind of slowly work back there. But that essentially lines up for what's going on in terms of this post protocol or post-injection protocol you know i think at the end of the day mo- majority of the times that we have these situations going on we, we're making our best effort of guessing right so we're not exactly sure and when you think about it we are 
trying to like, yeah, we're trying to facilitate the PRP as much as possible. That's the idea. You know, they think that the majority of the growth factors of PRP are released within 15 minutes of injection. So like the idea that like we want to mobilize kind of shortly after is because it may help decrease the spread of PRP and keep it where it needs to be. So that's like one idea of why we're doing that. And then there is another reason why we're doing like the boots for some people, potentially there's the thought that, Hey, if I'm disrupting a tendon, right? So we've talked about previously in a tenotomy, what we are doing is we are going in and we are taking that needle, needle, you know, fenestration, needle tenotomy, we're taking the needle and passing it through that tendon multiple times to start irritating that tendon from a mechanical. And then when we inject it inside from a chemical perspective, when we are going through a tendon, we are damaging a tendon. So there's a theoretical risk that we're making it weaker and that it may rupture. There's not a lot of strong evidence to support that. There's a, not really a connection between PRP and tendon rupture, but like I said, people still err on the side of caution because the last thing you want to do is inject someone's tendon, tell them that, Hey, you don't need a, a boot or you don't need to take it careful. And then they rupture their tendon. That would be a bad, you know, a bad look for sure. And so we're kind of thinking about what we do, you know, when we mobilize and we exercise, there's no specific exercise selection that we're talking about, but the majority of the people, like I said, started that range of motion and from two to seven days, started on strengthening uh, at about two weeks. And it's not sure. And from an NSAID use perspective, like we've talked about, just kind of circling back, like I said, a lot of them didn't limit anything pre injection, but some of them had some sort of restriction af after. And like I said, it's just, we're trying to figure out, Hey, are we going to, inhibit our platelets by using NSAIDs, which the platelets have lots of good stuff that we talked about in the PRP lecture in terms of relief in those alpha granules and the growth factors, all that stuff. And so that's what we're thinking about. So kind of to wrap up the study limitations, obviously there's so much heterogeneity inside of a PRP with so many different protocols. We've talked about that and there's no direct comparisons of, you know, even the injection protocols or the rehab protocol. So we don't know, Hey, this study reported, Hey, we do this and we boot them for this many days and then we get them walk in and then we do straight. That's like, and versus non boot, like we don't have any comparisons like that. It's just literally this article was just to try to say, Hey, what is going on in terms of what are the general consensus going on? And I think we do a good job of saying, Hey, this is what the literature shows. And they're kind of bringing it up and saying, Hey, these are the faults in our literature. And in terms of, Hey, we don't have a lot of data and we need to do a better job. And that's why I love this paper because it kind of gives us a baseline of, Hey, what are people doing? And a lot of times best practices are what we have to start until we get more and more data. So this is kind of a way of getting best practice. And so Overall, though, like I said, relative rest for a couple of days, anywhere from two to seven days, and then starting our, our stretching and range of motion. And then strength starts about two weeks with hopeful full return to play in about four to six weeks. And, you know, my takeaways here, once again, looking at PRP, I, this is fascinating to see, but I also think, like, can I extrapolate this to prolotherapy? And it may be a bit different. Obviously, prolotherapy works a little bit different in terms of that we're not injecting platelets in there, but or still having the same idea that we're going into a tendon potentially using the fenestration technique and we're needling that tendon and still causing trauma to that and injecting it with something that is a foreign chemical and we can have also chemical irritation as well. So it's very similar. And I kind of think of, Hey, when I do a prolotherapy injection, I do something specific there. And I kind of think about, Hey, I should probably limit this as well. One issue with the study as well, not necessarily the study, but in terms of the data that it looked at is they don't specify what gauge needle they're using a lot of times. Some people use a 21 gauge, sometimes an 18 I've seen, some a 25 gauge, and that'll make a huge difference. And when I talk about gauges, I talk about, that means how big a needle is, right? So the bigger the gauge, a 25 gauge, the smaller the actual needle. And so a 25 gauge is pretty small. And if you're fat, passing through a tendon with that, it's probably gonna do a lot less trauma than a 21 gauge, which can have some, you know, is much bigger and may lead to some more damage inside the tendon. So that makes a difference in terms of that protocol as well and so but when i think about prolotherapy i still do something in terms of activity restriction kind of relaxing a little bit you know my general protocol like i said for most things that i've seen for prolotherapy i'll do about a week of kind of hey keep her easy and then we can start getting in some stretching and then some isometrics and then by two weeks we will probably be starting our strengthening as well and that's kind of how i i work here i'm a little more um, I'm a little starting a little before two weeks, but like I said, we're really just kind of giving our best guess. There's nothing that we have there. So like we're kind of extrapolating it to prolo and also you're extrapolating it to your practice. Cause these are, like I said, best practices that people have done, but it's not even best practices based off of literature saying this is better. It's just kind of the general idea of what's going on. So, so overall though, like I said, talking about needle fenestration recovery, we've talked about that with PRP and this is just a general idea of, Hey, if you get this injection, we, they might be talking to you about non-weight bearing or limited restrictions. So just, I want you to have this information so that you know, either as a physician or practitioner that, Hey, this is what I should be thinking about. Or if you're someone who's getting this done to you, you can have an idea of what you're walking into. So that is it for today. Thank you so much for following along. I really appreciate it. If you would like comment, subscribe, or share this with a friend that would really help out. And that would mean the world to me. Um, but thanks again for joining me. Now get off your phone, get outside, have a great day. We'll see you next time.